Thank you. Um, so now we've our final keynote speaker uh, of the day is Dr. John O'Dea, uh, CEO of Pagliari, uh, to talk from an SME's perspective of opportunities and, and challenges for business in Ireland. Uh, you're very welcome, John. Thanks very much. Um, let's see, can I get this screen up here? Can you see that okay? Yeah, that looks very good. Do you want to go full presenter yeah, if you may? Full screen now, yeah. And uh, I think I have to do this. Perfect. Very good. Well, just before I kind of get into my own um, talk here, it's just one thing that occurs to me to listen to a lot of the, the conversation is that really this whole area of um, AI and um, image processing, that it's a tremendous opportunity for the whole um, uh, third level institution infrastructure to create tremendous value because, you know, we, we work with industry, <clears throat> we work in industry with, with um, third level institutions and hospitals all the time. We tend to work with a doctor that has an idea, but really doesn't have the kind of infrastructure to bring that idea out to a market a clinical device and you know you know the, the the hospitals are a fertile source of ideas with with innovative surgeons that, that we love working with but here this is really the, the the product actually is owned almost by the hospital in this instance because it's it's the imaging data and it's the analysis of that data and really all that can be done within the the educational institution you know that all the know-how capabilities to develop the product can be developed within the university. I mean, I, I, I liken it a bit to diagnostics, you know, diagnostics can really be developed a long way within an educational institution and really be just about commercializable, <clears throat> you know, quarter one in, in a transfer because they can be developed and tested. And, and similarly, you know, pattern recognition, AI, you know the raw material isn't plastic and metal it's 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 images that are taken during surgery and you know the the, the wherewithal is absolutely within the academic system to analyze that develop algorithms and test them and you know uh, as dominic alluded to it's very expensive for companies that really don't have access to that data to go buy that data whereas the hospitals and the universities have it for free as it were and and can really mine that and develop um uh, um, you know, we're, we're always looking to commercialize research. A lot of money goes into research. You know, you'd like that rolling back into the system, into the research system, into the, the universities and hospitals. And so I, I think actually this, this, you know, dawn of, of AI um, it creates tremendous opportunity for the third level institutions to create tremendous value for themselves. I mean, I, I've seen this in, in, you know, Medtronic with the, the, um, the the the, uh, the genius system they brought out recently, and um, you know I'm I'm familiar with other similar efforts that have been really 100% developed within the hospital and university environment and um, create tremendous value. So anyway, um, moving on. <laughs> um, today, uh, uh, Ron was kind enough to ask me to give a talk on my perspective on the capabilities of the medical device um, industry in Ireland now and and what's missing. So um, just a little bit about us. We're a SME. Um, we've been on the go now about two and a half years, and our focus is on advancing the state of the art and smoke evacuation and insufflation technologies for uh, all those types of surgery. <laughs> We're based in uh, Galway, and uh, our principal focus has been the development of a novel insufflator called EVA 15, which was FDA cleared last year. And uh, we're working very closely with uh, UCD and a number of other partners in looking to improve safety of, of surgery on COVID infected patients and, and trying to protect uh, OR staff from aerosolized virus. <clears throat> so in thinking about this, you know, I thought it would be helpful just to start with a bit of history of, of MedDev in Ireland. And <clears throat> really back in the 70s and 80s, we had a strong buildup of multinational companies um, in, in Ireland, particularly along the Western seaboard. I mean, we had a few, and I, I think really big inflection point for me was when Boston Scientific took over the, the old digital facility in Galway. Um, there was a, a lot happened subsequent to that. And so we, we had it in the 70s, days, but that was really when it kicked off in a very serious way. <clears throat> like I think back to the days where you, you know, Parkmore, you had one or two 
facilities, you have the Bard facility and a lot of grass <laughs> and maybe the, the early bit of Craigana there. And, um, you know, I think when Boston came, it was really that acceleration happened. And, and in the 70s and 80s, you started then to see the emergence of indigenous suppliers to the MNCs, you know, people that could make catheters, people that could make the various parts that went into the, the MNCs devices. In the mid 80s then, um, we really had the emergence of the first Irish end user device startups, you know, people that were making products that were going to be, you know, used by doctors as opposed to integrated into devices to be used by doctors. And um, so Mednova would have been one of the first, Caradine, which I founded, and Aerogen. In the 90s, then, I suppose you start to have the first exits of those uh, device startups and propagation of the staff from them into new startups. And <clears throat> I always say to engineers that come to work with us that, you know, that the best way to do a startup is to learn how to do a startup in a startup. And, um, you know, there are certain skills and ways of working that you, you, you learn and observe in a startup environment that you may not see as readily in, 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 a, in a large company. I think in the 90s, we start to see more emergence of venture capital in Ireland. Um, we dedicated biomedical engineering degrees. And uh, I think within IBEC, the Irish Medical Device Association has played an important role in gluing together all the disparate strands within the industry, be they multinationals and, and, and startups, <clears throat> now known as Irish MedTech. And then as we moved into the, uh, the noughties, um, you know, we, we start to see a lot of government funding going into the likes of Kurum. Um, SFI is putting a lot of money into the system, DTIF, which we've talked about. I think European funding for SMEs improved a lot over the last 10 years. Um, the BioInnovate program, which was set up by Ian Quinn, who sadly passed away recently, and, um, you know, uh, funded by Enterprise Ireland, um, brought a, a tremendous new uh, um resource as opposed to the start of infrastructure in Ireland. Um, the third level support infrastructure, you know, the money has gone in from government to put, you know, support for uh, smaller companies um, in place. And, and I suppose we've started to see in the emergence of digital health companies. We, we've, we've moved beyond the traditional metal and plastics medical device. <clears throat> So where are we 40 years on, I suppose, in, in terms of startups? Well, first of all, there's an awful lot of them. Um, indeed, like when you can have a top 20, it means it just shows you how many there are that they can actually pick a top 20. Um, so we certainly have a, a large number of startups. And I often say, like, if, if you imagine we have a population the size of Manchester and how many startups are actually coming out of that, if, if it were a city, it, it would be tremendous. It's, it's now internationally recognized as a hotbed for medical device startups. And what we see is founders coming from a variety of backgrounds. You know, early on, it tend to be engineers or engineers. And, um, but now you're starting to see like doctors setting up startups a lot more often. Um, seed funding is readily available between Angels, between Enterprise Ireland, Western Development Commission here in, in the West. It, it is actually reasonably easy now to get, get the show on the road. And you you know that there's the benefit of greater mentorship opportunities from those who have traveled the road. I mean, there are very many people at this stage who have built and sold medtech companies. The testing support infrastructure has improved dramatically over the past number of years. You know, it used to be you have to go outside Ireland to do a lot of different types of testing. There's very little testing now we have to go outside the country to do, um, you know, biocompatibility and uh, maybe electromagnetic compatibility, some of that sort of stuff. We, we occasionally have to go outside the country, but, you know, there is facilities within Ireland to do, to do the latter. Um, I think founders bring the playbook of previous startups. A lot of people that do startups have worked in startups. They've seen what worked and they've seen what didn't work. And, uh, you know, that, that knowledge that has been infused from working in startups, um, I think is, is a tremendous asset to new startups. And we're seeing more non-device startups, particularly in, in digital health. However, follow-on funding from seed round is still very challenging. I mean, it, it, you almost can be seduced into thinking it's easy to raise funding because you get through the seed round, but uh, it can be very challenging um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the rounds thereafter. And, and I think this has led to an increased importance um, for EU funding um, and DTIF funding. And, you know, I think it's Ireland, 
has done a, an extremely good job in, in raising, our Irish startups have done an extremely good job in raising money out of the, the uh, SME uh, investment vehicles in Europe. And, and indeed DTIF has been a, a tremendously useful addition to the funding landscape over the past number of years. So like, where do we sit in terms of skill sets for startups? I mean, in fundraising, I don't think we do too bad a job. Um, R&D, again, you know, you know, we've had great education from the multinationals in this country. And really, you know, where, whereas I talk about startup skills and, and picking them up in a startup, I, I, I really think that we all developed our skills in R&D and manufacturing and quality, largely from having worked from the best medical device companies in the world, which all happen to be here in Ireland. So, I mean, they really have been the, 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 the universities of medical device designers um, for, for many years now. Where we're probably less capable of is in uh, regulatory affairs, um, clinicals, uh, reimbursement, health technology assessment, marketing and, and, and business development. So in some senses, the things we're really good at are the things that we'd have picked up working in multinationals and, and many of us would have worked in multinationals before doing a startup. Um, but some of these other aspects, which are more market facing, are, are, are skill sets that are probably not our strongest uh, as a country. So there is great support infrastructure growing as, uh, every year. I mean, I, I was just so excited to see uh, the, the new um, MET, um, uh, GMIT MET um, center. You know, the, they just received a 840 grand to put in a, a fantastic imaging system. I mean, it, it you know, you, you had like even big companies that were having to go abroad to, to get imaging work and neurovascular done. Now they can just do it in their doorstep. Um, uh, absolutely uh, fantastic to see this sort of infrastructure. Um, I think, you know, <clears throat> from our own standpoint in surgery, um, what uh, Ronan Cahill and his team have developed in, in, in a matter is something that's quite unique with the, you know, the close proximity of preclinical and, and clinical studies. And Kuram obviously is, is, a, is a group that is, is, is uh, providing a lot of support to, to different companies. So when we get to commercializing, well, I suppose the story isn't as good here. I, I think it is pretty much a truism to say that for most medtech companies, their first market is outside of Ireland. And, you know, maybe digital health can be an exception, but the reality is that sales and marketing skills have to be developed in foreign markets because it's extremely difficult to sell products into the HSE as a startup. Um, you are you're almost precluded by virtue of like having three years of profitable accounts. And, you know, they're actually probably, there are very few startups that ever get pro profitable, to be honest, before they're probably acquired. And, um, and I think we can maybe look at what's going on in, 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 in the UK to maybe give us some guidance in this regard. Um, you know, could a small percentage of the HSE materials budget be allocated for new technologies, be allocated for SMEs? You know, we have a, the, the Health Innovation Hub, which is a good scheme for allowing companies to kick the tires of their device within a clinical environment. And, you know, and then you get a report and then there, there ends most of the time the, the relationship with the HSE. And I mean, is it possible that this could actually become part of a, a continuum where, you know, as you work through HIA, there could be some money put aside that, you know, if innovations have been shown to be valuable to the health system, you know, that there would be some way that, SMEs that, that don't meet the requirements, uh, financial requirements that, that are typically requested could, 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 be, um, could be able to get into the system, so to speak. Um, it's, it's, NHS have this interesting innovation and technology payment scheme, um, accelerated access collaborative as they call it. And really this is quite interesting when, when you read the lines there, they're a little small to read there, but they, they more or less said the program supports the NHS to adopt innovations by removing some of the financial and procurement barriers to introducing new technologies. So even they admit it's hard in England, but they have a scheme to, 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 to allow that. And, and speaking as a company like they would have sold a bit into the NHS, we found that very helpful because it helped our product get into the NHS because we'd face the same difficulties with the NHS as we would with HSE. Uh, device trials, um, really, you know, I think if you're designing products in Ireland, you really would like to be doing your trials in Ireland. There's so many benefits not least of which is you can kind of 
and go <laughs> do some cases and come home the same day. Um, there still are very few being conducted in Ireland. Um, I think, you know, we, we have a new body now, um, which has just started up in June, the new National Research Ethics Committee. It seems to offer more deterministic review timelines, and that's something, you know, we're already engaged with NREC now on a submission, and we'll see how that all goes. But it, it, um, it has brought something that's very deterministic. My experience over the last number of years is that hospital-based ethics committee are a um, they're kind of a black hole. You go in and you hope that your application will come out at some stage and you never know when. Um, there does seem to be a very deterministic review timelines associated with NREC now. So I think that's that's a valuable new addition to, to the scheme. Um, the biggest issue I have, in, in, and this isn't really just an Irish issue, but it, it's an EU issue, is that we don't do a, a we don't have a, a, an approval process that's risk-based. So for instance, HIPRAP, we, you know, has to be applied to for even a class one device if it's sterile. You know, the only issue is whether the device is sterile. But when you go into the process, you might as well be going in with a, 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 a TAVI valve. You know, the, the, the process is identical for a stethoscope and for a TAVI valve. And that's just a waste of resources in, in a way. It's tough on companies. I mean, the amount of documentation you're supplying for you know, devices that are trivially safe. Um, you know, HIPAA probably shouldn't be having to be reviewing. I, I know when we did one recently, there was almost a, why are you sending this to us? But, you know, this is what the MDR is going to do now. We're going to have all these very, very simple, safe, basic trials being done. And they're going to run through the same system that has to look at much more critically um, uh, products that are, that have, uh, they're much more safety critical than, than, than that. So... An interesting dynamic that's also coming out, of course, is the new UK CA mark, <clears throat> which is akin to the old CE mark. And I think it's going to give the UK a, an interesting <clears throat> advantage uh, in terms of when new technology would become available. Uh, the medical device regulation that's come in, it, I mean, to, in truth, it's not a lot different than what we used to do under the old CE mark. It's just that the 2 million devices that are on the market have all to be recertified and they're going to completely plug up the whole um, regulatory infrastructure for, for years to come. So it's, it's, it's a very worrying development in that standpoint. Um, you know, really a device that's been safe for the last 15 years didn't become unsafe because a new um, regulation was released. But th this is something that I think we're only going to begin to see. It, it just came into effect about two weeks ago. So... Um, so like, it's, it's interesting with the CA mark, it's like the old CE mark. Once you have a quality system, you, you, you just have to register your device and off you go. And, and I mean, so we'll end up being able to do trials with products that are commercially available in, in that market uh, as they're, they're really like, they, they just become like post-market surveillance trials. So this is as much an EU issue as an Irish one, but we're in the EU and the UK isn't. And so, you know, where the, I talk about these issues in terms of Ireland, they really are European issues. And I think that the MBR is, is, uh, is really going to impact the um, creativity and uh, ability for, for European companies to, to compete and get technology before the US. You know, I, I think the, the, the US FDA approach is much more sensible. You know, they take non-significant risk devices and significant risk devices and treat them differently. I wonder, is this something we could do in Ireland? I mean, without, because uh, um, this seems to be more like a, a regulatory requirement that isn't necessarily, um, I don't know, there may be a way that we could do this locally. Um, the question, of course, is do we want more trials in Ireland? Uh, I mean, I've never been in a hospital that isn't, overly busy. <laughs> so whereas we may talk about wanting to do trials, you know, you don't find too many doctors and surgeons who say, yeah, I've loads of time, love to do that. <laughs> um, you know, can we support more trials in Ireland? Are we going to plug the system up, for instance, with all these trials that are going to be done for the sake of doing trials, for the sake of releasing 20-year-old devices onto a market um, in accordance with MDR? You know, the, the great benefits of device trials are that it's early access to patients for new technologies. You know, the MDR is going to put Europe behind the US in terms of regulatory approval timelines. And, um, you know, again, this is a European issue rather than an Irish issue. But nevertheless, what it means is now that, you know, companies in Ireland would be looking to the US as their, their launch market. 
And, um, you know, that, sh that shouldn't be that way. Uh, finally, I suppose one point I would make, I mean, I found at least in the US that having MD, PhD degrees, it really encourages the pulling of trials into hospital versus the pushing of trials into hospital. In other words, I've always found that, you know, um, the doctors that are doing PhD degrees, that they're, they're looking for studies. They need studies for their PhD. So you, you can feel the pull when you have new technology. We want to do trials in that. Whereas, you know, really in this part of the world, you're kind of pushing trials into hospitals, trying to fit people, fit, fit them into people's schedules. And it, it's a very different dynamic. Business development. Um, well, can we leverage the co-location of multiple startups and multiple MNCs in, in, in the one small space? And, and, and I think we can. And, you know, Irish MedTech, formerly IMDA, is, is a, has been a fantastic melting pot for small companies to get to know big companies. And, um, you know, I, I think we, we have a unique thing going on here where that there is, you know, as I say, it's like one big, one big UK city. We have like 15 of the top 20 medical device companies in the world and all these startups, you know, there's no better opportunity for an Irish startup to get, held, get heard by a business development executive in the US or if they're based in Ireland. Most of them tend to be based in the US. I mean, we, we all know that, that you know, us Irish, we do try to help each other out when we can. And, you know, I, I've never experienced a case where I haven't gone to someone in a multinational and said, listen, who should I be talking to in business development about this product? I mean, and, and not, not only will they tell you, but they'll generally give you an email introduction. Obviously, then you're out in the big bad world with them, but you know we we have a better opportunity than just about any country I can think of in doing that. And indeed, now I'm, I'm involved in an initiative that's just underway at the moment from the American Chamber of Commerce to see can we get you know some of the the companies that are in Ireland to help some of the startups, uh, um, or at least get get them into those uh, companies' uh, business development chains. So we have a unique channel advantage, um, really, do in Ireland. Um, I think another thing that's important, though, is the company ready for a relationship with an MNC. Um, you know, and one of the things I've seen now over the last little while, <clears throat> you have people that are coming out into the consulting business that, you know, have ran worldwide material sourcing for the likes of, you know, Medtronic or Boston Scientific. These people would have essentially, you know, approved every vendor to those companies over the last 10, 15, 20 years. There's a tremendous knowledge set that, you know, can be leveraged off and, and possibly through Enterprise Ireland through the mentorship scheme to, 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 to leverage off, you know, what you need to be before you go to an MNC, you know, you know what, what level are your quality systems like, you know, what, what do you need to know before you come in the door of a Boston Scientific, for example. Those people are out there now. And um, I, th I think they are a, a very valuable resource because, you know, you don't want to go, you'll probably get one good chance, you know, so you don't want to blow it. So in conclusion, I think all the pieces are in place to develop an SME med tech company in Ireland right now. I mean, I've seen this industry evolve from, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, where, you know, there was two, two or three startups in this space to now where, you, where, where you're seeing like 10, 15 a year coming out and, you know, and they, they accumulate as the years go on. Uh, I do think, you know, that if there was some possibility to tweak the regulatory pathways for trials, we could create a competitive advantage for Ireland in performing trials. Um, in terms of early commercialization, you know, most of us are selling, uh, you know, we start building sales from Ireland rather than to Ireland. And, you know, it would be so much more powerful and enabling for SMEs if, if those initial sales could be into the HSE. Not necessarily saying they have to be permanent, not saying that the HSE should have to fly the, 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 the national flag and all that, but more that, you know, at least you get a chance to get in the door and sell a product. Okay, if you're kicked out six months later, so be it, you know, you, you know, you're probably not going to do any better when you go to America or wherever, but, uh, you know, I, I suppose as companies develop, they, they try to get that sort of stuff out of the way before they're going in the door of a hospital rather than after, the, after it. So, um, and, and finally, you know, there is a, an ability to leverage off co-location with multinationals through involvement and in, in the likes of, 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 um, 
yeah, the, the Irish MedTech Association and so on. And, and really, it's a great opportunity for SME to SME companies to meet with R&D and business development people from the biggest medical device companies in the world, and, and they are willing to help. So thank you very much for your time today. That's fantastic, John. Thank you. It's such a, a comprehensive uh, run through there. Very interesting to see you, you, you've, you've done most of it, I think, at this stage, probably by the sounds of things. Um, someone was asking, what do you see as the typical end game for an Irish SME? Is it scale up, sell off, get more funding, a, a, any mixture of the above? The reality is if you're VC funded, you're being prepared to sell as soon as that money comes in. Um, you know, it, it, uh, that is the reality. Um, the, um, you know, if you, probably if you look at one of our most successful indigenous companies, Aerogen, like it, it's not irrelevant that it wasn't VC funded. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, uh, that's the reality, you know, um, and listen, it's not a bad thing, you know, as I mentioned early on, uh, SMEs spawn other SMEs and, you know, if you get that multiplicative effect, you know, it, it, it probably is already being seen in what's going on right now. Perfect. Uh, John, I'm going, to, I'm going to move on in, in the interest of time to the panel, but I know what you've been speaking about will be of uh, major interest to, to all of them uh, from various different, uh, different perspectives. Um, 